fundamentally are only going to see a conservative success story if you have a party in a movement that has space for, for you, Lawrence, has space for Nigel Farage, has space for Boris Johnson, has space for Michael Gove, and even has space for people like Damian Green and, and David Cameron. Um, you need a philosophy that creates a movement that includes all of that. If you can do that, it's a slam dunk, as we say over here. You, you will defeat the left. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Happy Sunday, everyone. This week, I am joined by Douglas Carswell. For someone who never held one of the great offices of state, Douglas is one of the most important politicians of the last 20 years. Initially, in the heart of the Cameron Project in 2014, he sensationally left the Conservative Party for UKIP. He won his by-election and subsequently his seat at the general election pretty unheard of. He was instrumental in setting up Vote Leave, which oversaw the campaign to get Britain out of the EU. Sadly, we have lost him from these shores, and he now heads up the Mississippi Centre for Public Policy in Jackson, Mississippi, and it is my great pleasure to speak with him today. Hello, Douglas, how are you? Lawrence, thank you so much for having me on. I'm in, I'm in, in, in great form. Um, I'm loving it over here, and um, it's wonderful to connect with you again. Are you cut and cut, but casting an eye back to Britain, um, did Brexit get done, do we think, yesterday? I think it's pretty much done. I mean, the mess that Theresa May and Gavin Barwell and a couple of others left was such a dreadful mess, the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, and that it, it, it was really rather difficult to see what Rishi Sunak could do. Um, and actually, I think he exceeded certainly my expectations. I, I think on balance, this is this is a good thing. Um, but, you know, the, the, the original sin was putting the dreadful Theresa May in office to deliver Brexit when she, you know, she, 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 um, you know, she probably couldn't run a bath. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us what you really think. Um, Farage and others have been very damning of it, uh, regardless of whether uh, the protocol has been dealt with and whether Brexit has been dealt with. He says that this is not what uh, voters care about in the UK after over a decade of Tory rule. Um, what would you say? Do you think, do you, do you anticipate the Tories being wiped out? Do you think there's, uh, do you think there's any redemption for them? I mean, I, I think the Conservatives are very likely to be wiped out, but I think the reason they'll be wiped out is probably for something other than Brexit. Look, in, in 13 years, um, about the only thing that they've done, and they did it thanks to uh, the tremendous pressure Nigel and others put them under, um, was about the only thing they got right was Brexit. And even that they did under duress. And even having won it, they were extraordinarily clumsy and ham-fisted in, in delivering it. Um, it's all the other things that they've got so hideously wrong. Um, you know, the amount of effort it took to get the Conservative Party in Britain to actually be conservative when it came to our relations with Europe, the, the amount of energy was phenomenal. Think how much more energy we're going to have to expend to get them, to wean them off their idiotic sort of woke identitarianism, where they sort of promote people on the basis of, of things other than competence. Um, think about the effort it's going to take to convince them that they're flat wrong to believe that you can run a modern Western economy without burning hydrocarbons. Um, think of the effort it's going to take to get them to realize that actually People in Britain want a proper controlled immigration system. Uh, they've managed to do things that probably not even Jeremy Corbyn would have done. I mean, if you look at the level of taxation in Britain, it's the highest level of taxation since the 1950s. Now, tax was high in the 1950s because we had just fought a world war against Nazi Germany and Japan. Um, and yet somehow they've managed to um, spend to such an extent in peacetime, that we are now so indebted that we have to have these ruinously high rates of taxation. So, you know, I think the British Conservative Party is facing an existential crisis, but it's not Brexit that is anything to do with it. Brexit is the one redeeming feature uh, that they have. It's all the other failures. And and these are pretty fundamental failures. I, I, I remember during the fairly early on, actually, Lawrence, during the COVID epidemic, you and others were saying, hang on, can one really influence the trajectory of a virus by, by law, making people um, wear masks, stand six feet apart and not sit on park benches? And you and many others pointed out that this was slightly absurd. 
And yet, you know, we're governed by people who thought they could do this. And and they imposed these lockdowns, which are ruinously expensive. Really, the British political system now is in the mess it is for the Conservatives because of their response to lockdown and net zero. It, it's It's got very little to do with Brexit. Yeah, it certainly feels like a cost of lockdown crisis. And it's really interesting that your focus uh, uh, opposed, A, the fact that you were, a, you were a successful politician and you did get voted in for another party, that you're alluding to a lot of uh, yeah, common sense conservative values, certainly in terms of hydrocarbons and stuff like that. But this lean towards the cultural problem, the woke problem, the, 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 the anti-meritocratic anti-Western idea of promoting people based on their uh, on their talent. Do you think that the Conservative Party has got any interest at all in engaging with the cultural problems uh, that this country faces? Some of it, elements within the Conservative Party clearly do understand the problem, although I have to say a lot of them don't understand the problem. Um, you know, this is a party that internally has been promoting people on the A-list, on the basis of something other than competence and ability. And any institution that promotes people on the basis of something other than competence becomes incompetent. And I think one of the reasons why the British Conservative Party in Parliament has so many incompetent individuals on its front benches is because it's been promoting people on the basis of something other than ability for such a long time. But you know, there are some, nonetheless, within the Conservative Party who recognise that, if only because they realise their voters aren't too keen on it, that, you know, uh, trashing Britain's past and trying to pull down statues of um, British heroes, uh, you know, um, there's something there's something wrong about this. Um, but they've done remarkably little about it. Um, there are all these institutions, often taxpayer funded institutions, museums, art galleries, um, the Arts Council, that promote a neo-Marxist woke agenda, and and British conservatives have presided over this and done nothing to, to arrest this uh, advance of leftist ideas through Britain's cultural institutions. Um, I mean, I think the most outrageously leftist institution in Britain today is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Over the past 13 years, the British Conservative Party has had numerous opportunities to, to do something about it. Um, and they've chosen every time not to do anything about it. And in the last few months, years of a, of a dying or what seems to be a dying conservative administration, no doubt they will discover the hard way that by having done nothing about the BBC, the BBC isn't their friend. The BBC isn't grateful for being left in place at, at taxpayers' expense. Uh, the BBC is, is very much part of this leftist um, institutional capture. And they've, they've done nothing about it. It's almost like they've squandered the past 14 years. It's, it's bizarre. Yeah, that that is the thing. They 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 sit there and they complain and complain and complain about everything, but they've been there for for fourteen years. Um, you're in America, so uh, first of all, uh, before I ask you about what you're picking up in terms of the American cultural landscape, t tell us a bit about the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. We are a very prominent, successful state level think tank. Um, we try to advocate unashamedly for what you might call Reaganite conservatism, this optimistic, free market, uh, un unapologetically patriotic. Um, in America, as, as you'll be aware, there are 50 different states, and this means that different states can do different things. So here in Mississippi, uh, in the past two years since I uh, came in um, with the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, we have dramatically cut the state income tax. It's now a flat 4% rate. Um, we have introduced something called the Universal Occupational Licensing Law, which basically means if you've got credentials to be a, a, a specialist um, in a different state, you automatically get a license here in Mississippi. That's having a wonderful effect in sweeping away all sorts of restrictive practices in terms of finding work. Um, so we've done these things because we're able to. And what's really interesting is and what's really exciting is to see other states, other neighboring states in particular, copying some of the things that we're doing here in Mississippi. You know, for as long as anyone can remember, Mississippi has been losing population. People, More people have been leaving than coming. We're starting to see that turn around now. For the first time, more people are coming to Mississippi. Something really interesting is happening, not just in Mississippi, but right across the southern United States. Um, there is an enormous um, input import of, of people and capital and innovation into the, the southern United States. 
um, companies have moved from California to Texas. Uh, Florida is booming. Tennessee is booming. The southern United States is growing so fast. I think in economic terms, if not cultural and political terms, it's very much becoming the center of gravity here in the United States. And we want to make sure that Mississippi is part of this southern success story. Um, and so it's it's been great trying to spearhead some of that. And so for British viewers, what is the um, political, w w would Mississippi be categorized as a blue, a purple or a red state in America? Well, first, some, some of your viewers may slightly scoff at the idea of Mississippi. They may sort of think, ha, ah, Mississippi, isn't that the poorest state in America? It is the poorest state in the United States. But this year, for the first time ever, the per capita income in Mississippi will exceed that of the per capita income in the United Kingdom. In other words, uh, Mississippi will be richer than the United Kingdom for the first time ever. Uh, it's quite an extraordinary um, achievement. So, so don't, don't condescend and look down at Mississippi. Mississippi is now more prosperous than Britain. The, 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 the really interesting thing here in, in Mississippi, I think, is that it has been, in a sense, a one-party state. It was first Democrat-controlled from the time of the Civil War right through to the uh, early noughties. It was solidly Democrat. And about 20 years ago, it flipped and it became solidly Republican. Um, so you might think of it as therefore being quite conservative. But actually, the people who run this state often run it in the manner of a sort of socialist republic. There's a reason why it's the poorest state in the United States, right? It's because it's got all sorts of restrictions, it's got relatively high taxes, it's got, or it had relatively high taxes. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that people who uh, are notionally a conservative, who call themselves conservative, actually deliver free market Reagan type conservative economic policy. So often actually the biggest um, conflicts we have are with um, people who are elected as Republicans but have a decidedly anti-free market agenda. What we're trying to do is to, to, to advocate for genuine, authentic free market conservatism. Um, and, and we've had, I think, quite a lot of success in doing that. We've managed to convince an enormous number of Republicans to start doing sensible free market um, liberty movement um, policies. That's so interesting. And in, in terms of, you know, you... As I said at the beginning, you know, you, you were one of the, I think, almost the only uh, MP to to change, uh, to cross the floor and retain their seat. Um, you know, to have such power and commonsensical views. What 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 drove you away from the Conservative Party? What drove you away from British politics uh, in a direct way? And also, what are, what is the secret? And is there an opportunity for the younger parties, the insurgent parties of today, to make a dent in British politics? Well, turn that around. Actually, what attracted me to the British Conservative Party was two words, very simple, Margaret Thatcher. I grew up with this idea that a country that had previously seemed to be in decline, had lost its way, had been, frankly, becoming a, on its way to becoming a third world country, um, had been rescued by this inspirational woman who, who wasn't part of the establishment. She was a sort of grocer's daughter from um, the provinces that she came along and she she turned the country around. I, I was listening to um, some old um, videos of Margaret Thatcher being interviewed. And what's extraordinary about her is when she's asked a question, she gives a straightforward, often philosophy-based answer. She's not trying to appease people. She's not trying to triangulate. She's not using clever words so that everyone can project onto her what they want to see. She's actually taking quite a tough, sometimes strident position. Um, that's what made me realize I was a conservative. Um, I remember when I was probably in my early teens, um, I was very influenced by Milton Friedman. I, I, I saw the uh, TV series he produced, Free to Choose. That kind of made sense of the world to me. It, it, it allowed me to understand why rich people and rich countries were rich and why poor countries were poor. Um, I, I also thought that the British Conservative Party would be the best vehicle for achieving national independence, because I think the idea of believing in free markets and national self-determination kind of go hand in hand. Um, it was with great sadness that I felt I had to leave the Parliamentary Conservative Party in order to try to force David Cameron to have a referendum. 
And um, I was mightily relieved when that um, gamble paid off. You, you said I was one of the first. I think there was actually a member of parliament in 1926 who had left his party and changed parties, held on to it in a by-election and held on to it in general election. But I, I, I don't think anyone had done that um, um, since 1926. It was um, a gamble that, that paid off. Um, I hoped that having achieved Brexit, the British Conservative Party would rediscover what it means to be a genuine conservative. Um, I'm afraid to say I think the Parliamentary Conservative Party, and I don't want to say the Conservative Party because there are um, hundreds of thousands of people in the Conservative Party, most of whom are authentically Conservative, but the Parliamentary Conservative Party is clearly not got a philosophical template of, of any kind. Um, rather like Tony Blair, they, they say what seems to be expedient rather than what is right. Um, their vision is um, tailored to the audience to which they're trying to ingratiate themselves. And I, I think that's a fundamental problem. Um, in politics, you, you, you have to have this internal compass. If you don't have this internal compass, you become a feather for each wind that blows. And if you do that, you, you end up like all, 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 other, um, all other sort of autumn leaves, um, drifting with the wind and eventually ending up on a bonfire. And why do you think it is that the Conservative Party have lost that sense of uh, philosophical, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of rock that you're, you have to have of, of belief and meaning and duty and service and all the things that one... Why have they dispensed with this? And why was there no plan for post-Brexit? Is it because they didn't want Britain to... to Brexit? I mean, two, two separate things. I remember very clearly having won the a referendum. I was utterly exhausted. Um, I was emotionally exhausted. I was physically exhausted. I was, I, this is something I had um, driven for for a long, long time. And I was utterly exhausted. And I was only too happy to see people like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others um, step into um, not just um, running the campaign. They, they, they joined the campaign six weeks before the actual day of the vote. I was, I was hoping that they would then sort of take over the running of the country. Um, and there was then this, if you remember, this extraordinary falling out between them, um, which um, allowed Theresa May to come in with all sorts of hideous consequences. Eventually, they put that right by Boris coming back in um, and, and, and running it. Um, my, my feeling was um, that, you know, the people who accidentally ended up in charge of Brexit didn't really want to hear from the people who had been driving for Brexit. Um, I think many of the key architects of um, Brexit were, in a sense, marginalised. I'm talking about people like Matthew Elliott. I, I, I think people like Dan Hannan. I think had they been involved um, in actually trying to deliver things at an early stage, um, I, I, I think things would have been done um, much more effectively. Um, so I think the natural jealousy and tendency of politicians to want to take the credit and, and not, not work with others and not be collegiate was a big factor. Um, I, I do think that one of the reasons why, I mean, all political parties um, on the centre right that are electorally successful suffer from um, the fact that people join them to have careers rather than because they've got um, philosophical conviction. And, and that doesn't, in a sense, really matter. In, in a sense, that's a good problem to have. If people want to join your team because you win, um, you, you, you want to find space for them. The problem is that so many of these careerists joined the Conservative Party without really having any deep-rooted attachment to Conservative principle and Conservative philosophy. I, I, I think that was undoubtedly um, a, big, a big problem. Um, I... I also think you've got to recognise that the A-list, which was an arcane internal system that the British Conservatives implemented about 20 years ago, has had some pretty bad consequences for the quality of the people you find in on the green benches in Westminster. I mean, in a sense, the British Conservatives are about 20 years behind Labour. Labour started imposing A-lists in the selection process. So they would only select people who happened to be women or happened to be an, uh, an ethnic minority or, or whatever it was. They started to do that about 20 years before the British Conservatives. And so I think the quality of Labour 
MPs um, um, because they weren't selected competitively and, and because there were often people selected on shortlists, that, that started to suffer. I, I, I think you started to see a similar problem affect the British Conservatives. The A-list um, basically excluded a whole bunch of people from becoming members of parliament who would have otherwise become members of parliament. And you see the consequences of that in Westminster today. If British Conservatives really do want to, to win, they need to give their local constituency associations far, 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 far greater autonomy to choose candidates. Get rid of the shortlists that are imposed on them by central office and give them genuine autonomy to choose candidates. Now, of course, a party needs to have the right to veto certain people. Um, you might find that a particular conservative association in one particular region um, selected a wrong one. And, and, and obviously you have to have um, some sort of central veto. But other than that, you need to give it to the grassroots membership to select the candidates. It's the imposition of candidates on an A-list from the centre over the past 15, 20 years that directly feeds into the quality control issues that the Conservative Party now faces in Westminster. And, and for me, obviously, you know, my main interest in this whole area is this is this idea that you can't have anything, let alone a democracy, without free speech. And that seems to have uh, suffered a huge uh, attack uh, from both sides in the last couple of years. Did you have any thoughts on the fact that uh, uh, Andrew Bridgen's situation in terms of trying to speak in Parliament, uh, whether you agree with what he said or not, uh, to have been shut down in the way he was and, and spoken to in the way he was by the former health secretary. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with the full details of that. I'm, I'm talking to you from sort of 4,000 yeah. miles away in a, a slightly different time zone. But often during the whole um, COVID incidents, I... I I wonder what I would have done and how I would have felt had I been a member of parliament. I, I often had fairly strong views about the response to COVID, about the um, efficacy, not, not so much the vaccine, um, but of the efficacy of some of the so-called prevention measures. And I wonder if I would have been vilified had I been a member of parliament and I articulated those views. Um, you know, you, you need to create a political pearl. You need to have grit in the oyster. You need to have the awkward squad. Um, you know, you've always got to ask yourself, would the British Conservative Party today allow someone like Winston Churchill to stand in a winnable seat? Would they have allowed him with his contrarian views <laughs> to hold um, a position even on the back benches? Um, I, 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 I really do think that the British Conservative Party, maybe, maybe, maybe it's too late this side of a general election. Maybe what you need to do is to have a conversation as to how you can create a robust, reliable, authentic conservative coalition. And maybe that can only be something, a conversation conducted in opposition. Who knows? Well, the, the, and in America, they, they are in the process of opening new universities and obviously what you're doing and, and this idea of training new conservatives, because I think that that's one of the main problems we have as well. What's so exhilarating about conservatism in America, I mean, everyone, everyone in the UK, because... A lot of the news comes from CNN and the BBC. People all think, you know, Trump, will he, won't he? F forget that. That's not the really exciting, interesting story. The really interesting story in America is the revival of the conservative movement in the southern United States. You have a series of governors, you know, neighboring to Mississippi. Um, just last week, uh, Sarah Huckabee Saunders just announced that by 2025, every single child in the state of Arkansas will have a dedicated education savings account using public money that will allow them to go to any school in the state of Arkansas, private or public or homeschool, any school of their choice. It is a remarkable education revolution in one state in the South. If you look at what's happening in Tennessee, they don't have an income tax in Tennessee. They've got rid of it. No income tax. It's one of the reasons why Tennessee is one of the most fastest growing states in America. Look at Texas. Texas has got only not only low taxes, it has um, got huge amounts of inward investment coming into it. I, I think I'm right in saying that Tesla has pretty much uprooted itself from California and moved en masse to Texas. There's this extraordinary success story built on um, the application of conservative principles in the southern United States. And I think you're going to see 
a great future for American conservatism, and it will come out of this southern, southern, southern sort of um, um, laboratory. Um, which which particular individual, whether it'll be Trump or DeSantis or Nikki Haley or, 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 or Sarah Huckabee Saunders, which one eventually gets to um, ride the, that 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 wave and get all the way to the White House? To me, is of less importance. What what I find really interesting is that the building blocks of a new conservative revival in America are being put in place. Um, I'd love to see something similar happen in in, in Britain, but. For that to happen, it can't just be something done by the formal Conservative Party. It needs to be a much, much broader movement. And it needs to begin with a philosophical appreciation of what it is to be a Conservative. Um, I think people need to go right back to the fundamental questions. What is Conservatism for? What is it you're trying to conserve? Um, what is it What is it that you believe that is different to the Blairite orthodoxy of the past 20, 30 years? Um, Defending free markets in the 21st century is, is you know, is difficult. In, in previous eras, when Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher were trying to defend free markets, um, yes, they didn't have the organizational infrastructure in place that exists today. But um, they, they, they had a philosophical belief. And what we lack today is that philosophical belief. We've been focused, for example, on trying to uh, cut taxes. We've been focused on trying to reform specific bits of legislation. And we've talked about what impact that might have on GDP and percentage growth. What we haven't done is counter this leftist narrative about intersectionalism, about this idea that somehow there's something illegitimate about um, English speaking countries that, you know, um, as a CNN reporter put it, the United States is a, a, a republic founded by slave owners built on stolen land. And that narrative has seeped out of university campuses, into the HR departments of big corporations, into public administration, into the federal government bureaucracy. And that narrative is incredibly destructive of um, American cohesion, of Western cohesion, of, of free market ideas. We need to develop a counter narrative to that. And it's the failure of the conservative movement um, in Britain and America to develop a counter narrative to that that explains, I think, why it is that the left keeps on advancing. You know, we ask ourselves a fundamental question. We, we've got all these think tanks. You know, We've got the Mississippi Center for Public Policy here in Mississippi. Washington, D.C. is full of the most well-resourced think tanks, full of brilliant minds and brilliant people. But we keep on losing. Maybe we need to focus on a slightly different approach. We need to create a narrative rather than just focus on GDP and economics. The narrative of it, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but the, the, the difficulty with creating that narrative is anyone who tries to create that narrative is immediately called a racist or a white supremacist. And as you say, the intersectional uh, ideas that surround that terrible philosophy. But this whole identitarian movement is very, very difficult to resist because we still in Britain, certainly, and I think in America, that word, that allegation of racism still holds such an enormous power. So how does one, how does one counter this narrative um, without losing one's reputation, losing one's livelihood, losing, you know, losing all of these things? Well, Lawrence, as you know, probably better than anyone, the vilification of people who are guilty of not conforming to the groupthink is is incredibly destructive. It's, it's very destructive to people personally. I, I, I know a number of friends of mine in um, often quite leftist people in academia who, who have said things that have um, brought them into conflict with the, um, the kind of the, 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 the new Puritanism. And they've been they've been vilified. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their livelihood. Many of them have had their reputations tr trashed. Um, it, it is it is difficult. It is tough. Um, but you know we we need to recognise that what we're going through is in a sense a, a little bit like the Cultural Revolution in 1960s China. There's there's a hysteria of this leftist woke mob, and you know they cannot be appeased. They cannot be reasoned with. They must be confronted and they must be defeated. Um, if you concede anything, you know, if you allow them to come for the statues of, um, you know, um, 
you know. Slave Tom owners, then why wouldn't they go for the statues of everybody else? Yeah, they, they, I, I spoke to one of these guys the other day, actually, and he said that statues themselves were an abomination yeah. and it, that they were the gl- glorification it, of, of people who didn't deserve glorification. It, if you let them tear down statues of Jefferson, they'll be tearing down statues of Washington next. They, they, you cannot appease them. I, I think we've got to stop being frightened of our own shadow. These accusations that are levelled against people who don't conform to the group think, you know, I, I got vilified for, for, for joining UKIP. I got vilified for um, campaigning for Brexit. There was a time for about a period of about sort of six or eight months when I was unable to travel on public transport around London with my family because of um, the, the the leftist hatred that would be directed at me. There's there's a video, I, I think it may still be somewhere out on the ether of me being attacked by a mob in, in, in London. You know, um, these are th- th- this is nothing compared to some of the vilification that others have been through. But, you know, it, it's very real. Um, um, there was a time in British and American politics where if you disagreed with someone, you, you, you debated, whereas now physical intimidation, uh, hounding people out of their... Uh, work. Uh, these are these are commonplace tactics by people on the left. Um, it's not nice, but we have to respond because if we don't, we lose. And if we lose, you know, the the, the future of the West and the world will be pretty grim. I, the root problem is we need to be clear that the leftist foundational fallacy is cultural relativism. They they have this foundational belief that all cultures are equally capable of producing vaccines and, and, and Shakespeare and, and, and uh, lunar landings, and, and for that matter, genocide. Uh, that's simply a nonsense. Not all cultures are equally capable of producing those things. Um, if you accept, um, as the left would want you to, that there is no such thing as some cultures being better than others, that all cultures are, are equal, you, you, you preclude the possibility of cultural progress and cultural improvement. And, and yet, clearly, there has been cultural progress and cultural improvement. In the West today, people, I think, have um, a, 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 a better life, a better moral system um, than would have existed you know, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Clearly, progress is possible within cultures. And if progress is possible within cultures, then some cultures, by definition, will have progressed further than, than, than others. Um, we, we need to confront the left on this point. Um, the Western way of life is a better way of life than most other ways of life. Uh, that is why people want to come to the West. That is why tens of thousands of people are crossing the southern border of the United States to come into Texas. They're not leaving Texas to make their way to Venezuela. They're not trying to cross the English Channel to go through France to settle in Turkey. They're moving the other way. And they're moving the other way because there's something about the West that is better than the world outside the West. And no country is perfect. No society is perfect. There's plenty about the West um, that, 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 that could be improved. But we have to be clear within our own mind that the West is worth preserving. And then we need to ask, what is it about the West that makes the West better? Why is the West not just more technologically and scientifically? Now, the left would respond and say exploitation. You know, the idea that somehow the West uh, became prosperous by exploiting wealth from other societies. What, what wealth? Um, there wasn't much. Early um, European um, countries that industrialized, like the Dutch and, and, and the English with their um, early industrial revolutions, created the wealth internally and then um, expanded beyond um, their boundaries um, to to, to the wider world. It it was this change in thinking in the West, probably in the early modern period, um, which elevated the role of the individuals, some of the the, the ideas um, of of, of Hobbes and then Locke. This is what explains the secret of the West's success. If you want to know why the United States today is not just a better place than almost any other place on the planet to live. And it's not me saying that, it's all the tens of thousands of people who are trying to come into the United States who are saying that. If you want to know why the United States, which is only 4% of the world's population, or is it 5% of the world's population, but you know, ha- has accounted for all the great innovations in, in human um, uh, development from the age of powered flight right through to, to today, the age of the iPhone. If you want to know why the United States is so successful, surely it's got to be decisions that were made in that courthouse in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. It's got to be some of the founding ideas 
um, that are essentially Western. I, I would say not just Western, they're, they're Anglo-American political ideas. So it's a very precious inheritance and we need to be aware of it. We need to be unapologetic in defending it. And we need to be prepared to engage with those who, who dismiss it out of hand. Um, if you believe in cultural relativism, then you know, look, look, look at some of the cultures um, that are non-Western and ask yourself, would you really want to go and live there for the rest of your life? Why, why is it that people are only moving one way? It's very, it's it's absolutely fascinating, and and I agree with you. I think being more confident in in defence of of the whole idea of the West is is lacking, even amongst those that are we entrust to defend it. Speaking of which, you know, and, and free markets and the idea of uh, of you know maintaining the West. What did you make of um, this? You know, forty four days of Liz Truss and um, the fact that you know she. Basically, now in modern Britain, lowering taxes is now seen as immoral, and the smaller state is now seen as immoral. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Liz Truss was prime minister for forty something days, was drummed out of office because of the hysteria of many on her backbenchers, who frankly had never reconciled them to themselves to the fact that their preferred candidate wasn't elected. Um, one of the reasons why we were told Truss had to go is because she had introduced these unaffordable tax cuts. Well, it now turns out that the deficit um, is nothing like as bad as we were told to believe. Um, look, I, I don't think there's a conspiracy. I, I, I think there are things that Liz Truss and the people around her did that in reflection could have been done differently and could have been done better. I, I, I think the really big thing they got wrong was this um, blanket universal um, proposal to help people with um, heating costs, um, energy costs. That that was the really unfunded element of of of, of the budget, and and that far exceeded um, the, the the numbers you're talking about with 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 the tax cuts. Um, but she didn't yeah. stand, did she? She what 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 I found so peculiar about the whole thing was that no one just said slow down and let's give it a go. It was like, no, we've got to move on. We 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 yeah. don't have time to 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 see, as you said, you know, now that we actually do understand the data, it's not nearly as bad as was being flung at us. Yeah. Why yeah. didn't where was the courage and the backbone to hold on, to come out with a strong positive message for the future of Britain, and then just to fold so quickly? Well, I, I think this goes back to the lack of deep thinking and serious commitment to philosophical principles um, and a party that has been governed by the whims of those who devise the A-list. <laughs> you know, if, if you're going to put on the back benches people who are superficial, have no deep-seated understanding of conservative ideas and conservative principles, who have no deep-seated understanding of the moral case for tax cuts, um, you know, you're, they're not going to weather the storm. Um, if you don't have an internal compass in you, when when a, a, a gale blows up, you're going to get blown off course. And, and, and this is what happened. Um, you know, the, the consequence of getting rid of and defenestrating Margaret Thatcher was to put the Conservative Party out of office for a decade and to put into government, not just Tony Blair, but leftist ideas, the consequences of which we're still living with. I think the price, like an albatross around the neck, the, the curse of getting rid of Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss is going to be even more profound for the Conservative Parliamentary Party. Um, you know, um, the, 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 the bad karma that's going to come back as a result of, of that defenestration of, 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 of Johnson and then Truss. Is is you know they're going to pay a very very high price for it. So in the absence of a Conservative Party with convicted Conservatives in it, uh, you know selected on lists and uh, devoid of any of the values, and in bearing in mind that you did manage to stand for a small insurgent party and win, what do you what is your view on uh, the smaller parties in the UK today? And do you think there's any point in having one? having any oppositional parties to the Conservatives? And, um, and if I gave you £10 million tomorrow to set one up, what would you do first? I mean, I am one of the only people in British politics who has run as um, a, a, 
a non-establishment party candidate and 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 won and won not just once but 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 twice um and i can tell you it is incredibly difficult um the entire electoral system in british politics is stacked in favor of the cartel parties and it makes it remarkably difficult to 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 break through um but i i wouldn't be discouraged because the flip side of that is that a relatively small but determined party can actually cost a cartel party a, an enormous amount. Um, people haven't really ever stopped and questioned why it was Britain ended up with a referendum. Now, I think one of the reasons why Britain ended up with a referendum is because David Cameron committed to holding a referendum in the election he had against Ed Miliband from Labour, who wasn't committed to having a referendum. And that is why David Cameron unexpectedly ended up winning an overall majority, a majority, incidentally, that I don't think he was expecting to win. I don't think he would have committed to holding a referendum if he knew that he was actually going to end up with a, a, a majority. I think he thought he would continue in coalition with the Lib Dems. But it was the failure of Ed Miliband's Labour Party to commit to a referendum. And, and why am I going on about that? Because that shows that actually, even within our two and a half party system, Having third parties campaigning on particular issues does actually influence. You may not end up with backbenchers in Parliament, but you can certainly steer the course of British politics, actually just by being very well organised and very determined and being prepared to take 10, 15, 20, 30 percent of the vote in seats that the cartel parties were otherwise hoping to win. Mm. So, you know, don't be discouraged. Um, don't. Success is not measured purely in terms of the number of seats you have. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I'm a conservative. Um, I am not a member of the Conservative Party. I, If I was in Britain, I would like to think that I would be a member of the Conservative Party. But, you know, I, I feel that I've not left them. I feel that they are in danger of, of leaving me. A genuinely conservative party would not be in favour of the gradual socialisation of the British economy in the name of eliminating CO2 emissions. A genuine conservative party would be doing what needs to be done to control our borders. We would have come out of the ECHR and all the rest of it years ago. They would have just gone on and done it rather than talking about doing it every time they face an election. A genuinely, authentically uh, British conservative party would be all in favour of fracking and um, their, their approach to attracting um, growth would be to cut taxes. Um, the fact that so much of what I've just spelled out jars with what the current lot are doing um, explains the, the root of the problem. I, I suspect that it will take a, 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 a lengthy period in opposition for people to perhaps come to their senses. And uh, yes, I agree again. Um, in terms of the cultural aspect, you know, one is always looking. We had obviously with the with the referendum and what UKIP did in order to get Cameron to commit to the referendum, and then the referendum itself. As you say, you did. No one needed to really be in power necessarily, or not a large number of people needed to be in power. But for me, it's um, all of these issues do boil down to a cultural problem which this country in the West has more broadly, which is a lack of belief in itself anymore. Yeah. As you say, this this um, this relativism, which has infected yeah. all of us. Um, do you think that what Britain faces is is simply an economic problem, like re reverse, um, you know, defer net zero, reverse, uh, you know, this, the, 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 the ever increasing size of the state? Or do you think culturally we've got to sit there and say, send out a different message, which is we cannot have a country and a nation without border, uh, our borders controlled because it damages our culture. We cannot assimilate in such huge numbers of people into our country every year. America is doing the same. It's two million across the border so far, more than two million, I think, so far this year. But again, in a, in the nations which, do, which have such declining birth rates, what other option do we have than to import the next generation? Well, there's, there's a lot in what you say. I mean, I, I, I think um, to unpack some of it, um, it is possible, I think, for a country like the United States, like Britain, to assimilate uh, people who arrive. Um, but in order to do so, I think you have to, like in the United States, have um, uncomplicated patriotism. 
What, what I find so uplifting about the United States is to see the American flag everywhere, to see this just taken for granted belief in the United States. I love the fact that, you know, American school kids that I know give the Pledge of Allegiance every day at the beginning of, 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 of class. Um, it's uncomplicated. And it, the reason why it's so important, incidentally, um, is because it means that if you're a first or second generation, you can come in and you can belong. It, it's patriotism is is the most extraordinarily inclusive um, system that that there is. Um, it's the very antithesis of ethnic identitarianism and ethnic division. So I, I think genuine patriotism, teaching young Brits and young Americans about their country's past in a way that acknowledges there are certain shortcomings no one's perfect there are certain things that you know certain laws and leaders that um we produced on both sides of the atlantic that are regrettable but but that overall the story of our countries is one that we should take inspiration from um we need to be prepared to 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 do this if you do this successfully then you can take a first and second generation migrant from pretty much anywhere and they will become a, a, a citizen like all the rest. There may be some unique challenges associated with certain types of migrants if those migrants have a belief system where they think that, you know, a, 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 a sixth or seventh century prophet is the last word on how to live your life in 2023. Um, there may be some questions of cultural compatibility there. But I think overall, if you get a country that is uh, patriotic, patriotic, as they say over here, that teaches its children um, to take pride in its nation's past, um, then I, I, I think these all of these challenges can, can, can be overcome. I've been very struck here in the United States by just how incredibly inclusive it is. You know, I, 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 today I've been talking to um, an American who I think their ancestry is of, uh, of Indian, by which I mean um, uh, um, South Asian uh, origin. Um, I've been um, talking to one of whom I think is of um, Hispanic, uh, uh, Mexican origin. Um, and I've been talking to one who, if I were to guess, would probably be maybe Scots, I don't know, German origin. And they're all uncomplicatedly American. And that, uh, surely that's the secret of American success. It's They've got a genius for creating uh, American and, and I think it's one of the reasons why, incidentally, so many people want to come to America because of what they call the American dream, this idea that you can come here and build a better life for yourself and your family. If Britain wants to be a successful country, it's got to be able to do that. And that means taking back control of the teaching of the history curriculum, taking back control of the cultural agenda, being unashamedly pro-Britain and Britain's past. Um, and creating a narrative that people can feel they belong to. Well, I, I, again, I couldn't agree more, but there, there, there's, there doesn't seem to be a single one of, as you called the cartel parties, who will stand on that agenda. I have it on very good, uh, inf you know, very good, oh God, I'm so used to this, you know, information from some quite senior Tories that uh, Boris Johnson, for example, has absolutely zero interest in any cultural issue whatsoever. And Rishi Sunak doesn't seem to have any interest in any of the cultural issues. So if the Conservative Party aren't interested in the cultural issues, and the only way that we can save the country and to prosper again is to engage with these cultural issues, we don't seem to be able, we seem to be witnessing the the dusk and then the night falling over the West in the UK. Okay. There are some rays of sunshine in this. I, I know that a while ago, Munira Miraz, who worked for Boris Johnson, was very involved in a project that I, I think is not a million miles away from some of the things we've been talking about. Um, but look, I, I don't think this can come from the parliamentary party. You know, you, you, changing this, it's not just about passing laws and issuing government decrees. It's going to require a broader conservative movement. You can't, you know, what I fear the Conservative Party doing is is deciding they want to do something about this and then trying to influence the teaching of history through the national curriculum. Uh, you know, if if they understood the nature of the problem, you wouldn't have a national curriculum in the first place. Um, it, it, it's a failure of the Conservatives to understand that you're never going to deliver authentically conservative outcomes by using the fiat of the state and its attempts 
to deliver certain outcomes using the fiat of the state that has created the state architecture that has then allowed the left to capture these things. So dismantling the administrative state, deconstructing the leftist institutions, that's what you need. And Antonio Gramsci, who's a Marxist revolutionary from Italy, understood brilliantly how you win if you're the left. You don't win by persuading a majority of people to vote for you. You do it by capturing the cultural institutions. You need to reverse engineer the Gramsci takeover of our cultural institutions. You need a way of forcing the leftist agenda out of the Arts Council and using the way that you finance the arts to either attain that or to get rid of state funding of arts altogether. You, you need to have people working for the BBC that will ensure that when they want to produce documentary output, they commission great thinkers like Andrew Roberts or Niall Ferguson or Dan Hannan and not the leftist drivel that we get put on our, our, our TV screens. It, it, it goes far beyond politics. Look at some of the um, entertainment output um, commissioned by British broadcasters. Often it has a woke agenda, a woke narrative in the background. Um, you know, even, even right down to children's programming. You, you've, you've got to be prepared to tackle it at that level. Um, it's quite granular. Um, and often what it requires is not ministerial engagement and public funding. It, it's a removal of ministerial engagement and a removal of public funding because allowing willing customers to pay for certain content means that you're going to have an automatic check against them being spoon fed someone else's ideology, genuinely, genuinely speaking, because, you know, people don't want to be um, um, lectured to by Wokies on their own pound or dollar. So it's, it's, it's ra rather than sort of um, repopulating the institutions with those that think on, you know, on our side of the argument, if you will, you want to completely cleanse these institutions of politics altogether, which which ultimately means you have to reduce funding for them. So reducing right. the size of the state is the beginning. I, I mean, take, for example, what are British children being taught about the past? Um, a, a conservative might suddenly realise that they're being taught ideas that are inherently leftist, particularly the view of, of, of British history. And their instinct would be to say, right, let's put our people in charge of the quango that oversees the national curriculum and get them to teach proper British history. The problem with doing that is if you micromanage what children are taught long after the person you've appointed, even if they are actually authentically conservative, and I doubt that, um, long after they've gone, you will create, you, you will have a system in place that will allow people of yeah. a leftist position. Yeah. So... Like Why a not? free speech yeah. czar, as they bring in, a, 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 they, they're so excited about bringing in this, you know, free speech czar for universities. And you and I just there go, no, the, the minute you get the no government, the free speech czar will just impose leftist free speech suppression all over it. It's not, yeah. it's not the just answer. Allow, just allow the free speech. Just allow parents to send their child to any school of their choice and allow schools to teach what they want. Don't have a national curriculum. If, if, you had a market in the education space. If you had mums and dads in control of their child's tax pounds choosing schools, you can guarantee pretty quickly, so long as you didn't have a national curriculum, that the schools that taught the kind of history that needs to be taught would flourish, and those who taught wokest nonsense would find themselves losing customers. That, that's the approach you, you have to take. Sadly, after 14 years, I think it is, in power, all that the British Conservatives have done on education is to extend Andrew Adonis's and Tony Blair's academy programme, it was a, 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 a new Labour innovation, to have a handful of um, free schools and to um, solidify the centre's control over the education system and the curriculum. It, it, it's, you know, it is to education reform what Ted Heath was to economic reform. It is a cul-de-sac and a false start and a failure. Um, it needs a completely different approach for a future Conservative administration. The equivalent of education vouchers, giving mums and dads control over their child's share of the education budget, is the only way you are ultimately going to defeat woke ideology in the classroom. Any, any, any other approach 
is doomed to fail. No wonder they thought you were a dangerous, dangerous man in politics and you needed to be harassed on the train and, and, and bullied into silence. This is far too commonsensical for, for good. I, I once had a conversation with Michael Gove when we were in opposition and I, I asked him, you know, he, he was very keen on, on extending academies, he was very keen on more um, um, uh, free schools, um, and I remember saying to him, was he interested in the idea of giving parents control over their share of the age? And he, he said, no, there, there was no interest in that at all. And, and I, I had many other battles to fight. I remember thinking, well, if he's not interested, I'm not going to waste my time pushing for this. Um, but I think, you know, looking back, we're often led to believe by conservatives that our education reforms are something we should be proud of. I, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. I think rather like the prices and incomes policy Ted Heath introduced in the 1970s, it's a, a false approach to trying to improve education. It needs something far more radical, far more bold, and something that the Conservatives have deliberately and, and intentionally not done over the past 14 years. Oh, we, we miss you hugely in Britain. It's so refreshing to hear all of this said with the optimism of someone who you can tell has his feet on free soil. Is there uh, anything else you want to say, Douglas, that you think is a message to us here in the UK who are all just a bit wobbly? Don't, don't, don't lose heart. Um, there will come a time when British conservatism looks like it is in crisis. And maybe that is what it will take to get people to understand on the conservative right that they need fundamental change in their approach. You fundamentally are only going to see a conservative success story if you have a party and a movement that has space for, for you, Lawrence, has space for Nigel Farage, has space for Boris Johnson, has space for Michael Gove, and even has space for people like Damien Green and, and David Cameron. Um, you need a philosophy that creates a movement that includes all of that. If you can do that, it's a slam dunk, as we say over here. You, you will defeat the left. At the moment, without a philosophy, there's too much factionism. The very idea of suggesting that David Cameron and Nigel Farage would be in the same movement, um, the, very, the, the very implausibility of that explains the problem. And it's a lack of binding philosophy that, that is the root cause of this problem conservatism faces. If we fix that, we can create a, a broad-based movement. And if you do get this coming together of a new conservatism around a traditional understanding of what it means to be conservative, a rereading of Friedman and a rereading of, of, of Locke and Hobbes, to be frank, if you can have that, then we will win. Well, that's so we will. There are there are rays of sunshine, but first of all, we're going to have to suffer a bit more. But I I completely agree with you. It, the whole point is you've got to have a broad church on our side of the argument because it's not monochromatic thinking. It, the whole point is that we accept a lot of people who who align around a set of, of values, and then what the left do is they take everyone and turn them into accepting of one value, and they they want to turn them all into the same. It's um, it's so fascinating to talk, Douglas, and thank you so so much for taking the time. Um, thank you for to, to talk and um, and good luck in Mississippi and um, don't get shot. I hear you're in the murder capital of the whole of America. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. I love living in Jackson, Mississippi, but like every city, it has its challenges. Of course. Well, thank you for a common sense and optimistic outlook for our future, Douglas Carswell. Thank you.